Hi, it's Sue Greenwald here. Today I'm with a welcome guest, David Adair. Hey, David, how are you? Fine. How are you doing, Sue? I'm doing good. I heard your story on Dr. Sala's channel, and I'm going to put the links below in the description here because it's a fascinating story. And I instantly knew I had to talk with you. It was a very strong feeling. And for those that don't know David's story, we're going to talk about it. We could talk for hours and hours and hours, but David invented the fastest rocket known yet to exist. Is that correct? That is correct. You said Mach 37? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I don't really understand that other than it's fast. So, and this was in the set early 70s. Right. Right. And David is a self-taught pilot a self-taught farrier, I think. Um, and you've done so many things, but because of what he's done, uh, he was basically forced to enlist in the army slash ended up in the Navy, got uh. shot down twice, <laughs> captured and escaped. He's been tortured, uh, attacked by a rhino, escaped um, the jaws of a tiger, like stuff you can't even believe, right? But, and all of that is fascinating. We're going to talk about it all. But what I want to talk about today is Pithilum. All right. So we have two Pithilums, Pithilum, the rocket, and then Pithilum, the bean or the entity, the right. day at Area 51. So David, if you could tell us a little bit about your background, I think that would be really helpful. Okay. Um, God, where did I start? Well, when I was about six years old, uh, I would go to the library a lot because I was reading books. And um, <laughs> Mrs. Hunt came in. She's a librarian. She's about 80 years old then. She's looking at me, and I'm over in the 600 section where the technical books are. And I'm sitting on the floor in the corner because I don't want to take a chair from an adult. That's the way it was. And uh, this was um, number 10... Pocahontas Coalfield, District 10. Yeah, just like Hunger Games, I grew up in District 10. And um, it belonged to the Pocahontas Coalfield Company. And um, this was Welch, West Virginia. Um, so I was there, and she's looking at me. She walked over to me. She goes, are you reading these books? And I gave a smart aleck answer, and I didn't even know I did it. Um, I just told her, well, there's no pictures in them. I must be reading them. <laughs> and she just kind of looked at me and go, huh. <laughs> this son was something else. Anyway, she said, how much of these books you remember? And I said, everything. What do you mean everything? I, every, you know, anything that's in these books, I know. So being Mrs. Hunt, as, you know, Missouri, show me. She grabbed this book off a shelf. She goes, all right, what's it say? I said, well, it helped to hear the title of the book. She said, uh, quantum physics, um, singularities. I went, oh, yeah. Uh, what page are you on? She goes, 93. I went, a singularity results from a collapsed star, and when it does, it, it distorts the gravity fields to such an extent that you could be stretched for millions of miles inside this thing and still be alive. And she shuts the book and she goes, okay, you got every word right. You remember the, the verbatim? I said, yeah, that's how my brain works. And she goes, well, how many of these books have you read? I said, all of them. The entire 600 section. She said, You've read all these books? I said, yeah. I was trying to learn quantum physics, differential mechanics. It wasn't a lot in Welsh, West Virginia in 1954. <laughs> yeah. Or 1960 at that time. So uh, she said, uh, does anybody know you can do this? I said, no. Good. Don't tell anyone, not even your family, nobody. Because you're going to get ostracized. And she goes, you know that word? I said, yes, I do. Um, they'll get, they'll be afraid of me. She goes, yeah. Then they'll probably try to hurt you, hang you from a tree or something. So 
She said, don't tell anybody. And have your mom bring you back here at 8 o'clock tonight. So we did. And it was at the end of the librarian meeting. <laughs> all women. And um, there were some young girls in there, but it was all females. And she introduced me to them all and said, this is our new librarian, David Adair. And I turned around and looked at her and said, librarian? She goes, yeah, you're a librarian. Now, being a librarian, you can order any book you want, or as many as books as you want. And I thought, oh, my God, what a terrific gift. And I said, really? She goes, yeah, tomorrow we probably need to order some books, don't we? Maybe in the 600 section? I said, yeah, we do. I, she said, maybe you want to make a list of them. I came back the next day with a list about two feet long. And um, we ordered hundreds of books and she said don't tell anybody we're doing this because she goes they'll, they'll, they'll fire me so i ordered all these books and that was such a gift because i could now expand out without leaving my place right. and um so i started reading all these books i had oh i had stacks and stacks of books everywhere we made a special place in the back room closet where I could stack them all and um I'd read I'd read 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 and um it really helped a lot uh I was there was a lot more books than we had available that were available worldwide so we didn't have no there was no such thing as internet or pagers or modems or cell phones or none of that stuff I mean the only closest thing we had to an internet is a telegraph. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there wasn't much there. And um, this was really, you know, I used it all year long and um, did a lot of drawings, did a lot of uh, putting things together. And um, I was just looking, I was working on something um, the other day. And, um, as soon as I find this page over here somewhere. Um, yeah, here it is. Um, it's, um, give me an example of what I learned all those years ago. Um, there. Mathematical formulas. Yeah. And now, learned, you had been receiving formulas through dreams prior to reading the books or after reading the books? Uh, that's an excellent question. Nobody's ever asked me that. Let me think about the timing. Um, the dreams came after the books, which was really a good, I, good situation because what I learned in the books was basic, but boy, what came in the dreams were advanced. But I was able to read it because I had the basic understanding of it. So it turned out timing was perfect. Um, and then as uh, I, I'd i write down the dreams all the, every night and built this book up. It became, um, I think, 93 or 96 pages thick. It was a composition notebook. Remember those kind? Yeah. And um, so I'd fill that thing up and um, I'll go back over it and look at it and go, well, it tells quite a story of how all this comes together. Um, but what I was interested in, especially in the book, the notebook I was writing in, where did those come from? Because it was beyond my books. It was, it was like you go up to page 456 and the book ends. Well, the dreams would pick up where the book ends. Wow. And you just keep on going. So it's like, wow, where's all this coming from? I, you know, you're a little kid. You don't think about it. You just, experience it so um and my mother made me a lamp that she stripped the neutral cord out whenever you touch the lamp it'd come on and off and this is like 1966 i thought i told my mother i said i think that's a patent i'm not sure <laughs> but i'll just use the lamp so i'd wake up at three o'clock in the morning hit the lamp big old what she gave me an artist pad i could write down because you're you're drowsy, you can't, you're not really right. organized. Yeah. 
Then you go lay back down in the bed and go back to sleep and pick up on the dream again. So I turn the light off, roll back over, sure enough, get more, wake up. There's a lot of uh, a lot of disturbed sleeping for a month. But this thing finally got completed. And um, and when it did, uh, I was really lucky the way I was born. I was born with a brain that was left and right. Um, I could do theoretical sciences, but I was really good in applied science. That's where you pull the toolbox out, roll up your sleeves, and build the damn thing that you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, it separates them. They can't, one is good at one thing, one's good at another. Rarely do you come by and somebody can do both. Well, I can do both. And so I started building stuff. And um, man, some of the trinkets and toys that turned out were strange things. Um, I built a lot of my own equipment um, because I could just go at it from raw materials. Uh, but where things really got better was... Um, from my dad's side of things. <laughs> my dad was a, a coal miner and he married the daughter of the mine superintendent. Now the mine superintendent, if you don't, if you're not familiar with coal fields and coal mines, how does all work? Mine superintendents are like governors. They're extremely powerful and um, they own the community they live in. He owned the company store. The old song, I owe my soul to the company store. Well, he owned it. So imagine how much influence he had. Enormous. So he was watching my dad work in the coal mines. And he didn't want his grandchildren to be fatherless one day. Because we were losing a lot of people in the coal mines. Right. Okay. So he told my dad, he said, I understand you're good in auto mechanics. He goes, yeah. Well, that little service station down at the bottom of the hill there, yeah. I own that. I'm going to give it to you. I want you to work there and run your business. And I want you to stay out of the coal mines. And dad said, okay, you know, great deal. So he was so gifted in mechanics. So he never made it past fifth grade. Uh, so my dad was a functional illiterate. And you go figure, you got me over here in quantum physics, differential mechanics. And you got a father that's a functional illiterate. I mean, you can't make this stuff up, y'all. After listening to your story, it really hit me. Like, you really had the perfect family structure. I really did. I had a mother and father that they didn't understand me that well, but they just enabled me and facilitated me. And um, <laughs> my mother described it in a story once. She said, I was three, uh, no, I was two years old. And I was playing with a model rocket that fell behind the refrigerator. And I couldn't get to it. So my mother just, and my one of my middle brothers, they just backed up and said, watch him. They were watching me. And I was staring at the rocket. And I went and got a mop and came back, got the mop, stuck the mop handle back there and pulled the rocket forward and I could play with it. And I put the mop away. And at age two, my mother said, there's something not right about this kid. <laughs> you know, we got to keep an eye on him. And so um, and they did. And I was building stuff in the basement of the house. And when dad saw me moving things in like um, <laughs> liquid hydrogen and cryogenic fluids and all this stuff, um, nitro, he said, you know, we have an old dealership building out there that's part of the property i'm going to put you out there i said okay he said if you launch anything you won't be taking the whole damn family with you right right he said if, if you just blow the building up that you're in out there we'll just put a plaque up this is where david used to be <laughs> and i said okay dad that, that'll work so he said well have at it and um really fabulous place it was um if you ever seen a, a imagine a dealership garage building, oh, enormous room, out of the weather, um, out of people's sights, and uh, I, I painted all the windows black, mm. so um, people can't see in. Dad said that was a good move, so I started building all kinds of things in there, and uh, 
And then I noticed something my parents would do. I was only four or five years old. And um, I watched them put blankets up over the windows in dad's garage. And I'm going, you know, I walk outside and look at it and go, there's can't see no lights. So I said, who are y'all hiding from? Well, these guys would come in with these cars and they'd have 200 gallon tanks in a trunk and it's not gasoline. It's moonshine. They're moon runners. And these cars have 392 Chrysler Hemi engines in them, uh, 413 Golden Lines, um, 429s. I mean, these are big, powerful cars. Because think about it, a 200 gallon tank, one gallon weighs nine pounds. So you're carrying 1,800 pounds of dead weight in your trunk. Right. And you've got to outrun these guys that's chasing you called revenueers who will put you in federal prison for it. 50 years if they can get their hands on you. So these drivers became really good and uh, dad would tune up these engines so they were just powerful. And um, we'll uh, let the answer machine get that. So anyway, they, um, they'd come in and he'd tune them up and they couldn't see the lights. The revenues were looking for a garage where these cars are coming out of. And they never did find it. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to pause. I forgot to tell you the other day. would come in yeah. and they would, um, these were, these men became well known later because they became NASCAR drivers. NASCAR was built by moonshine runners. They had driving curvy roads at high speeds and they were excellent drivers. And these guys were like, A.J. Foyt and um, Fred Lorenzen, Fireball Roberts, they all came from this world. And they all just go down south about 500 miles to Charlotte, North Carolina, and they, they, you know, they worked with NASCAR. But anyway, NASCAR didn't exist at, at this time. Okay. Uh, so my dad was working his garage, and this guy came through one day. And his car broke down, and Dad said, that's a Spicer carburetor. It's very complicated. It has a water jacket built around it. I mean, it's, it's talking about a carburetor that's, you know, big, bigger than a shoebox. And it take you all day to change something like that. And he told the guy, he said, I can change that in about an hour. And the guy said, you're kidding. Can I watch? He said, sure. So my dad was so fast because he would learn to tune up a car turn out the lights and let the cars go away so the drivers wouldn't get caught by the revenueers. So he was very fast. And this guy's watching him go through this, all this complicated stuff, like moving a, a hot knife through butter. And he goes, God, he said, um, I'm coming from Detroit. I'm on my way to Daytona and we're going to race on the beach. Um, I'd like to hire you as my, as my mechanic. Can you do that? And he goes, yeah, I guess I could do that. And uh, he said, hi, my name is Lee Petty. <laughs> he will have a son named Richard Petty, who is the greatest stock car drivers that ever existed in this in the history of it. So my dad said, OK, let's go down to Daytona. And, and he, he worked with um, Lee Petty. And I grew up in a Petty family. And they eventually moved. Uh, up here to North Carolina to be closer to Charlotte. And a lot of the moonshine drivers uh, up around the area, they got their own big garages around here. So um, I was looking at the garage and it's really laid out nice, the Petty Garage, it's state of the art. And um, so I built uh, a 426 Chrysler Hemi engine from the block up. And um, people always ask me, he said, uh, you, you're like a rocket science guy. You, you're in labs. You, you don't do heavy work. How do you get arms like that? And I said, um, from honing blocks on engines, you know, the honer weighed more than I did. And um, so I, I built up some upper body strength with the uh, mechanics and um, 
uh, one of my cars, one of my engines won the Grand National. Wow. Now my dad was going to say, he's telling Petty's and them, boy, wait till the world hears my 12-year-old boy built this 426 AME engine. I said, Fred, wait a minute. You, you can't say anything. Why? There's a guy standing over there named Bill France. He's the head of NASCAR. He will hang us from those trees over there because there's child labor laws. We can't have somebody 12 year old cranking out, you know, winning engines. It's just not going to stand for it. And he said, Dave, you understand? That? I said, yeah, no problem. I, you know, I'm just glad to be in the shop so I can help out. But, um, but Richard would stand there and, uh, he's, he's younger than uh, his daddy, of course, and he's looking at me and he says, Daddy, we're going to do something for David. I mean, gee whiz. I mean, he's given us three Grand Nationals now. His engines are just wicked, you know. And, uh, so Lee said, well, David, what can we do for you? I said, ooh, could I have the shops at night? And they said, of course. Anything in the building. And if you can't find any materials, we'll order it for you. Wow. Gave him a set of keys and gave him the codes and let him have the shop. Now, a NASCAR shop and a NASA rocket shop are mirrors of each other. Both shops produce speed. And they work with materials like aircraft aluminum, stainless steel, titanium. We had all that. Plus, we had drag racers that... Um, uh, Richard was getting interested in. So our fuels were liquid hydrogen, nitro, liquid oxygen, and that required special handling equipment because these are called cryogenics at 325 degrees below zero. So you had to have very special containers just to pour the stuff from one thing to another. Point is, everything I needed was there. When I didn't have some, I ordered it. And so the first rocket I built Went, we pulled it out into the back lots where we were, and that thing hit. It ripped out of there, and it went 10,000, uh, no, 50,000 feet. I built an altimeter tracker. 10,000 feet up? Yeah. Wow. And it's, it's not hard to track yourself. I built an altimeter for a dollar and 60 cents. And people go, what are you talking about? You take a, a piece of stick, 36 inches long, you screw two little eyelets in it that like kind of you put the screen door hook in. So now you got sights. Then you glue a protractor on a board and the protractor has a hole in the center and you put a pin through that and this big long stick can look into the eye sights. You track the rocket up, look at your protractor, measure your distance from where you're standing to where the launch pad is which I normally made at 500 feet because my cosine would be one, very simple. And I can tell you with a stopwatch how fast and how high my rockets would go. As accurate as any NASA multi-million dollar altimeter tracker. I did it for a dollar. About how old were you when you built that first rocket? I was seven. And... Uh, so, and you had already uh, built, helped your dad build, or you designed, or whatever. Yeah. Three winning uh, NASCAR engines. Right. And and because of that, I had learned to use machines in the shop, like press and you know, press machines, uh, rollers, benders, cutters, shears, all that stuff. I knew how to use them. And because uh, the other mechanics taught me how to do it. So I was fabricating whatever, you know, uh, and the engines, you know, I was using torque wrenches and every kind of tool imaginable. And so um, I got good at it. And um, I applied that knowledge from the cars straight onto the rockets, and it all worked. And and this is really before the mathematical formulas and the dreams were coming in. Is that correct? Yeah, they hadn't even started. This, this was before this all that. This is just plain Jane you at this point. Yeah, I was just, yeah, this is just me, you know, and I thought, I'm in this rocket, this, you know, well, it was a NASCAR shop, but man, I had a shop available to me and all the materials I needed and fuels and stuff. Oh, it's just fabulous. And so 
I was cranking out and I didn't crank out my rock. <laughs> when I tell people I'm building rockets, they thought like burn Estes rockets from Estes, you know, a little rocket motor you slide into it and hit it, and psh, you know, goes up about 1200 feet. No, that's not what I was doing. No, these were full blown missiles. They were huge, 10, 12 feet tall, weighing up to a half ton. And they are what we call cryogenic pumpers. They would, I built the pump systems that would pump the cryogenic fluids into the combustion chamber. And I made my own combustion chamber off the lathes. I remember my first one was a uh, three quarter inch walls. It was really heavy, but it was an excellent combustion chamber. It was a divergent convergent duct system, which, um, you know, it, it, it borrowed a lot of technologies from Benelli principles and other things like that. So um, I understood all this stuff and I put it together and out it went. And, and then the petties were noticing what I was doing. They saw one of the rockets take off and it incinerated an area the size of a football field. I mean, it's just <laughs> hydrogen is a part, you know, it has 50,000 BTUs per, per gram. And um, so there's a lot of power in these things. And they're watching that thing go and they go, David, what are you doing back there? I said, uh, building rockets, guys. And um, What attracted uh, you to rockets? Like you were working on cars. Um, what converted you over to rockets? Uh, this, yeah, it's a good question. Nobody ever asked me that. Um, it, was a, it, was, it became a medium and uh, area of, I could use it to test things. Uh, I'd get a hypothesis, a thought, scribble down what I think would work and then apply it to the rocket technology because all this stuff is in motion. It's fast, really fast, faster in cars. So I said, well, can't use the airplane. It's faster than them. So a rocket, yeah, a rocket would work. So I used rocket engines to validate a lot of my theorems. And, um, and the result is there was a lot of, a lot of stuff came, uh, I got some patents that came out of that stuff. Um, and then I learned how to file a patent. And, uh, and I did well because um, even though a lot of forces in my life came in, took a lot of things, they didn't get everything. And I retired when I was 49. So I have last 20 years, I've never had to work for anybody because I own my own systems. Cool. And um, people don't even think about that. And I don't sell books or tapes. People go, why don't you have all these books and tapes? I don't hawk those things, people, because I don't need the damn money. I got my own money. It's, it's, I've got it's dividends. It's not about the money, though. People are interested in the story of you. Like, how did you go from a little boy to what you've done in, you know, 12 years? You know, like, like that's not a common story. And no, then, I I was born old, I think. You know, I, I was so advanced for whatever age I was. That was not where I was at. Like, oh, he's seven years old, going on twenty-five. Yeah. Um, it was like that my entire life. And by the time I hit forty, I was like, had the experience of a person that's eighty years old in that field. And they're going, "How are you doing that?" I said. And where do you get the time? I said, it just happens, guys. I just, I multitask. I do three or four projects at one time, work on this one for a while, then go over and work on this one, then this one. And, um, and the result is uh, people who know me well, they said, God my, you've lived about 10 lives in one. I said, yeah, well, I guess my brain just allowed me to do all that stuff. Yeah, but but in, it's my opinion. You've had like there are no coincidences, okay? No. You've had so many synchronicities. Yeah. Escape death multiple times. Oh man! People no. just offer you just exactly what you need, or just you know what I mean. It's all been yeah. perfect. Now it hasn't been an easy life. You've had a lot of hardship too. I'm not saying it's just yeah. a piece of cake, but 
when you look at it, it looks like you were helped in so many ways. It's actually pretty yeah. beautiful. There's always something. Yeah. Staying on the sidelines or somewhere around me and I'd catch breaks and stuff that would really help me a lot. And, um, and I followed up and followed through with things. So, um, all the possibility of things that you think about when you're young. Well, in my case, I made them all come true. I forced them and I worked at it and, um, I was able to accomplish things beyond my years. Um, but yeah, and everything that I did, it was a layer effect. It added to what I was already doing. Right. And if you had a whole series of dots you're trying to connect with me, you'll find all the dots line up. And um, it's been that way my entire life. Um, and it, I thought I was going at 70. I turned 70 a week ago. Oh, yeah, happy weeks ago. yeah, January 6th, I was 70. And I thought, um, well, I guess I'll just fade away, you know. No. Old soldiers never die. They just fade away. <laughs> so, um, no, it wasn't the case at all. Um, people come out of the woodworks again. And then this guy named Michael Salas shows up. And um, it, I thought, I asked him, uh, he filmed and filmed and filmed. And he got 10 hours of video out of here photographed a hundred documents I had and that's the first person I ever let in my house to really look at my stuff so anyway I thought I better get a lot of it on tape and on um, on file because if I die it's all going to go with me and that's really a waste because I can really make your lives a lot easier yeah. uh, so it's anyway Tesla had um, left us his notebook and it wasn't taken. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, like, so that's why, like, even a book of just your story, it doesn't have to have anything scientific in it. Could be no. really interesting and helpful to people. Motivating. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, God. I did, <laughs> I did things that just really shouldn't have been. Yeah. yeah. You build the fastest rock on Earth, but that wasn't good enough. No. There are only two types of rocket engines, solid fuel and liquid fuel. That's it. That's all we got today. Ask NASA. Ask European Space Agency, China Space Academy. Ask any of them. They'll tell you that's all we got. No, there was a third one, which I built, and it was neither one. This thing was an electromagnetic fusion containment engine. And they said, that's impossible. How could you have done it? Remember all the equipment I already had around me? I had major labs already. Well, somebody else shows up. And that's when things... I was doing all this rocket stuff, and um, and my mother, of all people, uh, my dad got hurt in a garage accident. He couldn't work anymore. So my mother started out as a candy striper, a nurse's aide, and then she became an LPN as a licensed practical nurse. Uh, they have to go to college and get, they don't have that degree anymore. It's in between the RNs and the doctors, the LPN is. So my mother became a full-blown LPN in, uh, at age 40. In 1966, in the town we live next to, Mount Vernon, Ohio, they built the first ICC unit intensive care unit in existence in the state of Ohio. There wasn't any, there was no such thing as ICCU. It was nowhere. It didn't exist. So my mother, she was a night owl. She loved it 11 at night to 7 in the morning shift. She loved that. So they said, would you run the third shift of the ICC unit? She said, sure. So my mother became in charge of the ICCU from 11 at night to 7 in the morning. Now, why is all this important? Because it's leading you up to another meeting. She got this old man in there, meaner snake. His name was Irving LeMay. And Irving had a tendency to violate nurses and <laughs> goose them and stuff. And then he hit one of them in the side of the face with a cane, his old cane. 
and she came back, the nurse came back to my mother's nurse station. She said, what happened to your face? He said, um, that old LeMay man hit me. She went, what? Hit me with a cane. Yeah, so she ran down there, grabbed his cane, broke it across the foot of the bed, took the sharp part and stuck him in the neck and told him, you hit another one of my nurses, I'll come back and murder you. I will kill you and tell the world you had a heart attack and you will be gone. <laughs> well, Irving became my mother's new best friend. <laughs> now, Irving had a son that would come in to visit him, but his son had a paparazzi problem back then. Because his son is named Curtis LeMay, four-star general, chief of the Joint Chiefs, uh, founder of SAC, Strategic Air Command, or Nuclear Deterrent Forces, even today, designer of the B-52 Stratofortress, running over 60 years in business. You know, most jets only last five, six years. This thing's going on six decades. You can't find anything better. So the point is, he was a little famous. He was the guy standing next to John Kennedy in 1964 in the Cuban Missile Crisis. He's the one that would push the button that would send us all into a nuclear oblivion. So needless to say, the guy's got a little bit of fame and notoriety. Well, he would want to see his dad and paparazzi be waiting for him. So he started coming in at 3 and 4 in the morning to see his dad. And he'd have to go, he had to go through my mother to see his dad. Okay, connection. So he had to get to know my mother. So he befriended my mother because LeMay was a smart man. Curtis, LeMay, Curtis was smart. So he befriended my mother and he asked her, he said, you got any children? She goes, I have three boys. Two of them are okay. The third one we got to keep an eye on because what, what's wrong with him? Getting in trouble? No, he, he blows things up. And that got, <laughs> that got LeMay's attention. He goes, what do you mean he blows things up? <laughs> oh, he's firing these rockets. What? Rockets out of cow fields. And they go real. They go miles up. And they're so fast. He said, you're kidding. He said, Does he write anything down in a book? Yeah, he's got this big notebook he carries all the time. Could you bring that notebook by one night? I'll come to visit dad and let me see it. So he looked at it and then he turned around and asked my mother, do you have a copier? Mm -hmm. Which actually they called it back then a Xerox. Right. Do you have a Xerox? So he goes over and he copies about a third of my book. Thank God he didn't do it all. And then he took the copies and went to Columbus, Ohio to a, a this huge place called Battelle Memorial. Battelle Memorial is a gigantic government think tank. In 1965, they had 137 Nobel laureates on their staff. I mean, that's, that's, that's insane. Even today, that's insane. So they were a direct competitor of RAN. So RAN and Battelle ran, they basically run the entire countries, uh, everything in military secrets, all of it. So he takes my papers over there and he hands it to him. He said, is this just scribbling or is this something important? Well, they looked at it and they came back and said, where's the rest of the paper? It said, I only copied about a third of them. They said, where is this person? What institution is he at? And he goes, um, no, he's just flying rockets and cow fields. You mean those the papers mean something? He said, yeah, he's closing in on containment of 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 electromagnetic fusion containment. He's 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 actually getting the containment to work. And he said, Oh, it's not just scribble. No, it's serious. And they said, Can we keep the copies? He said, sure. And then they snail mailed them to England. So this other guy looked at it and he called back and said, Where is this person? Would you believe he's just a teenager and he's launching rockets and cow fields? He said, well, i got to come to Ohio State University and I've got to work some projects with Patel. So while I'm there, let's make arrangements. I'd like to meet him. 
So I'm on the front yard one day when I'm not, <laughs> that was my other job. I didn't fly rockets or burn the grass up. I mowed the grass. <laughs> so I was mowing the grass and, and here comes my um, high school uh, chemistry professor. And he's, and I'm not even in his classes because they told me I wasn't smart enough to be in their classes. Hmm. And I I dropped algebra. I started it for, then after about three weeks, I just turned the book into the teacher and said, I'm dropping out. So this, she's saying, he says, so Stevie, you can't even do algebra. And uh, this chemistry professor, he had not one, but two PhDs. Everybody else had masters. So this guy's, and he's a graduate of Ohio State University. He said, oh, really? Well, he's not in my classes, but he comes down after school he works on the blackboard. Come in, look at the blackboard. He's working theoretical technical horsepower. You ever tried that? It's enormously complicated. And he's got everything from quadratic equations to you name it. And the algebra teacher said, Well, that can't be possible. He would would he wouldn't even do the algebra. He said, Well, the reason why he's somewhere between calculus and trigonometry, I guess he might have found algebra boring. So he just quit. And she goes, you're kidding. And went, Come down and look at the blackboard. That's not my writing. That's his writing. And quite truthfully, there's some stuff he's put on there. I don't know what it is. It's beyond me. It has something to do with fusion containment fields, which I don't even know what he's doing with that. And um but I help him whenever I can, but I can't help him too much because truthfully, he's beyond me. So I don't want to hear this stuff that, you know, he can't do algebra, he can't be in college credit courses because he's not smart enough. The problem is he's beyond measurements. Right. He's just something else altogether out there. One day we might have schools that could handle somebody like that called magnet schools. But right now, the poor thing is just struggling and trying to, when he's a high-speed boat, he's in, he's swimming with turtles. Right, right. So he's trying to keep pace and not out accelerate everybody. And it's just frustrating to watch it happen with him. So they said, you're kidding. No, I'm not kidding. He said, I'm serious. So... He pulls into my driveway and tells me, I need to take you to my alma mater, OSU, uh, State University in Columbus, which was an hour away by car. So he's hop in my car and let me take you over there. So I said, okay. I just finished mowing the grass. So I said, we can go. So we went over there and I walk into this big um, amphitheater. And Ohio in the summer sometimes very muggy and you could walk in this schoolroom you feel the, the sticky heat and the boards would creak and crack in the floor mm -hmm. and there was milk glass in all the windows with chicken wire do you remember that yeah and that's how old this was in the old schoolroom so i look inside this big amphitheater and the blackboards go all the way around the room and they have ladders that you slide Mm -hmm. and then that hit this little guy sitting down at the desk way down at the bottom i step up at, i'm coming in up at the balcony and i'm looking around i went he's messing with my math and he stands up down there and he goes your math indeed and i went oh wow it's very similar oh you're you're working on on a comprehensive theory kind of like uh, relativity, but bigger. He's trying, it's the explanation theory. He's trying to explain everything all at once, all at the same time with everything. I said, good luck with that. And I said, inside, down there behind you, where you're standing, that will not work. He goes, what? Yeah, let me show you. So I come down there, I erase it. He goes, no, wait a minute. I said, relax, watch this. So I write this out and I said, Try that. He goes, wow. He, and then I'm 
starting to find out how smart this guy is by his question. He's sitting there and he's looking at it. He goes, how did you validate that? I said, rocket engines. And then the next question, I knew how smart he really was. He said, well, how did you get containment? I said, I can't. I don't have enough brain cells. I don't know how to do it. It's, it's out of my reach. You got any ideas? And he's sitting there and he goes, yeah, I might. He said, um, where do you get your ideas from? I said, they come to me in these dreams all the time. I write them down in a book and put them to work. And um, so I'm, I'm, go I'm going up steps. And he said, where are you going? I said, well, you don't want to talk to somebody like me. I said, There's a crazy person getting dreams and writing all this stuff. He said, a lot of my stuff comes to me in dreams too. He said, oh, we're kind of on the same wavelength. Why don't you have a seat? Hi, my name is Stephen Hawkins from Cambridge, England. He, at that time, had just got his PhD. He walked with a cane, very fragile, and he also sits in Newton's chair, which is, a, if you know anything about math or academics, that's, that's so high up there, y'all, you can't touch it. And um, so I found out who he, I didn't know he was, he was just a, Theoretical astrophysicist is what he was. Uh, just got his PhD, and nobody knew him. But I, we got we became friends, and um, we stayed friends through the years. And um, I do miss him; he's gone now. But um, God, what an IQ he had! But uh, I, yeah, I get these memories him. Um, one of the things he liked doing most of all, he'd tell me we would go to the beach in our wagon. Well, my parents had a 1955 DeSoto station wagon. He goes, no, think a little older, David. And I went, a gypsy wagon is what he had. His family would go in an old gypsy wagon pulled by a mule and go to the beach. Wow. wow. And I, just stuff like that, you know, just a lot of personal stuff. But, uh, so are you like uh, maybe 12, 13, 14 at this point? Uh, let's see. I was, um, yeah, I was 13. Yeah, okay. So so already in your lifetime, age 13, you've read every book in the library. You've been getting these dreams with these mathematical formulas. You've right. designed engines. You've designed rockets. And then you've met, well, you know, you didn't know they'd be famous at the time, <laughs> but you've met several famous people. Like, yeah. how exciting is that? Well, I didn't know it was exciting. I was just pleased to meet them because yeah, yeah. it was nice to meet somebody smarter than me. And um, and I mean that in a humble way, but um, because in some of these advanced areas I'm working in, it was hard to find anybody that would could help you. Well, Hawkins could. And um, I helped him with his math, and he helped me with um, theorems. But it was a good trade-off. So anyway, uh, I had friends listen to me, and they go, wait a minute, stop. You helped Hawkins with his math? What the hell are you? I said, I don't know, a freak of nature, maybe? And they said, <laughs> I guess so. So, um, but yeah, that's just average everyday stuff for me. Um, but yeah, then when LeMay came online, though, um, he knew Hawkins. They knew each other. And they started talking about me. And, um, and then LeMay had an entire different game plan. Right. He wanted to do something. And his um his autobiography book is called Iron Eagle. Tells the kind of guy he is. You take a look at that book, look at him on the photo of him on the back of the book, and you think that guy got fired because he got mad at North Vietnamese because they wouldn't come to the Paris Peace Talks. And he just told them on international news, he yelled at him and said, if you don't come to the Paris with the peace talks, I will bomb you back into the Stone Age. 
famous quote. And next day he was fired by Robert McNamara, who was the Secretary of Defense at the time. You check it's all out. It's all history. It's real. It's real. And um, so if you look at the Iron Eagle, or they called him Bombs Away LeMay, <laughs> <laughs> that was his nickname in World War II. Yeah. But you look at him, you go, he's only 49 years old. He's been fired like he's going to quit. This, <laughs> this man is not going to quit. So he wants to do things. And what he wants, he's he feels very threatened by um, communist control. And he was, <laughs> uh, I said, you know, lighten up. Those people don't want to do anything. That, well, he he wanted uh, nuclear weapons bothered him because it's leveling the playing field. And so he said, we need to get an edge on nuclear weapons. I said, well, what kind of edge are you talking about? And he said something real quick, and I, I remember hearing it, but I didn't know what it was. He said, we just have to have first strike capabilities. And I thought, is he talking about baseball? What is he talking about? What is the first strike? We never heard this thing before. Mm -hmm. So what his grand plan was this. He was going to replace the B-52s that fly circles outside the airspace of the Soviet Union. And if they get a through a warning system called failsafe, they would be told to go in and bomb nuclear bomb so union into ash and being right there at the airspace there's not a whole lot of time to do things you got about a half hour and he said that's too long we got to get there faster so he wanted to replace the b-52s with this other aircraft that he was involved in called the xb-70 the valkyrie you have got to look at that thing up and look at it. And I know what they say about it. They said that 1968, there was a crash of one of them that he built two. And that the other one in 1969 was sent to the Air Force Museum in Wright-Patterson, Dayton, Ohio. And that is true. You can go there and look at it. They call it the savior plane. Because everybody looks, looks at it. They walk in, they go, Jesus, <laughs> it's, it's massive, and it was designed in 1958. It's a delta wing nuclear bomber. Delta wings means triangle. That triangle wing shape is the area of a football field. This thing is enormous. It's got six huge engines, which unlike any, these are ram engines. They're they're not they're the right thing under pulse engines, which is what the Aurora has. You're not supposed to know about that, but the Aurora is the fastest thing still out there. So anyhow, he looked at the uh, Valkyrie, and he wanted to build 45 of them to replace the B-52 fleet. And then he would look for a very fast rocket to put in the bomb bay of these bombers and put them at the edge of the Soviet Union. And when he saw my rocket leave out of White Sands, New Mexico, at Mach 37, I covered 130 miles in 3.2 seconds. That's insane. Even today, nothing can touch that. So he said, I'll drop your rocket pistol in the bellies of these Valkyries. And when we give them failsafe, they'll go in, they'll drop the rockets. The Soviets will be watching their scopes and see a street come in and they'll go, what's that? And by the time they get the word Watts, they're vaporized, winning first strike. Now you can win nuclear war. And I said, I asked him, I said, wait a minute, what about the nuclear submarines? Uh, it will result in about 30 to 35% loss of population. But we thought that was reasonable. Oh. And I'm sitting there going, not if you're in the 30, 35%. <laughs> I said, that's insane. You can't do this stuff. So we had a big problem with that. And uh, he's wanting my engine. And he saw how fast I was able to get it to go. And so anyway, back to the Valkyries. They said that there's only two built. That's a damn lie. 
you can build two as cheap as you build cheaper and you build one. So you build one, you now you've made all the jigs and all the molds and everything in place to manufacture them, and they wanted 45 of them. There was more than two built. Mm -hmm. One crashed in the desert, one went to the museum, but there was still more of them. They just did not disappear, and they kept them at, at Area 51. Okay. And that's where they were, and that was probably at least four of them. And that was probably a bargain, you know, half a dozen been cheaper probably um, because, you know, just think about it. Who's going to overlook them? Nobody. Nobody. And you think they're just going to build two and that's it? Hell no, they're planning to build a fleet. The point is, LeMay wanted to do all this stuff. Now, he still could do things up to a certain point, but he was fired. But still, he wore a uniform and carried the weight of a four-star Air Force General Chief of the Joint Chiefs. And that's lifetime. You, you may be fired or you don't have that job, but you walk in the door, people stand up. It doesn't matter. That's lifetime. So he still got considerable power, mm -hmm. especially within the Iron Triad, the government, industrial, private sector section and uh he just picks up the phone and does whatever he wants so he decided to run for vice president of the united states in 1968 he was running and the presidential candidate that he's running with and running mate is george c wallace right and 19 check this out people think y'all know so much about history you don't know squat all right, they were running for president and vice president. Wallace gets shot. That's the end of LeMay's political things. And he hated politics. He said he was one that said politicians are like uh, diapers, they're always full of shit, and you got to change them often. <laughs> and uh, I thought, God, oh my. And he was the one that cussed out Senator Barry Goldwater. Barry Goldwater was one of the most powerful senators in history. And LeMay just cussed him out because Barry Goldwater said, hey, what's going on over in Hangar 17 and, um, and Area 51? What's up with all that? And boy, LeMay, <laughs> Goldwater, in an interview said, LeMay told me, you ask me that question again, I'll kill you. Oof. You know, he said, don't ever ask me anything about those ever again. And Barry Gorn said, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, this is the power. That, and this is my project manager. I'm under the wing of these people. And you're and you're how old at this point? I'm not. I'm just 16, 15, maybe. And uh, that's where we come to things for... Uh, What's his name? Michael Salas went bonkers when he saw documents I pulled out. I said, look at this. Here's a letter from Congress. Got all the letterheads on it. Got all the signatures on the bottom. Right. Right. And it says, Dear David, while Congressman Ashbrook is running for president in 1972, we're in the process of um, attaining the Titan missile for you. Now stop right there for a minute. What did you just see in that letter? That Congress is handing over a Titan missile to me. A Titan missile is 130 feet tall. Got twin 98,000 pound thrusting engine. State-of-the-art intercontinental ballistic missile. And look at the date on the letter. 1970. When was I born? 1954. How old are you? I'm 15 years old. You're handing a state-of-the-art ICBM to a 15-year-old? <laughs> what the hell is going on in there? Yeah. And you can find that letter. The original copy is in the Library of Congress of John Ashbrook. Wow. And you go out and see the curator, and he'll spin the wheel and open the vault, and out come these letters. And there's 12 of them. Um, John Ashbrook died. He was my congressman in Ohio. He died so fast. There wasn't time to sanitize his records. So 
So these these letters got out and got into the library. And now yeah. you can't touch them. Yeah. But um, proof, you know, something's up. Here's Congress <laughs> in the process of handing you an ICBM. What the hell is going on? You know, and, um, and just more and more stuff like that. Um, my, you know, people go, how could your mother ever meet LeMay? Well, I went to pull her employment records mm -hmm. and they were gone. Mm -hmm. And the woman said to me on the phone, she said, I remember your mother's name. It was unusual. It was Evangeline Tyson Adair. And it's gone. I don't know where it's gone. I knew what happened. LeMay took it. He did away with the records. He's burying his tracks. And I sat around and I thought, well, what can I do to get around this? There's one place he could not go. As powerful as he was, there's a place he couldn't influence called United States Social Security. I mean, they're like the IRS. You don't mess with them. It took me two and a half years, but I got this document back from Social Security with a big gold stamp on it. And the gold seal says, this document is admissible into a court of law as evidence. So you flip it over in the back and it says place of work. Martin Memorial Hospital, Mount Vernon, Ohio. Years of work, 1966, 67, 68. That was my mother's social security records. What's that got to do with anything? Pull Irving LeMay's death certificate. Lay it down next to my mother's record. Where did Irving die? Martin Memorial Hospital, Mount Vernon, Ohio. When did he die? 1966. It's all right there. Right. right. It all lines up. All the dots, everything connects. That's how my mother knew LeMay and LeMay and me and all this crap stuff. So when I fire my rocket out of um, White Sands Proving Grounds, that's what we called them back in those days, White Sands Proving, not White Sands Testing Grounds, but Proving Grounds. Anyway, my rocket went ripping out of there, and it landed about 456 miles northwest, exactly where they wanted it, they being a guy named Dr. Arthur Rudolph, one of the little sweetie he was. Um, I was warned about him by Warner Von Braun because he came over with them in Operation Paperclip. And Arthur Rudolph is the chief architect of the Saturn V engines that took us to the moon in Apollo. He is the recipient of the most distinguished award from NASA, the highest award you can receive. And he's a cold-blooded sociopathic killer. He murdered 100,000 people building rockets Pina Monday because he's a colonel in the Gestapo. And that's your recipient of the NASA's award. What a bullshit story this is. Go check it out. It's all there in the records. Right, right. This mm -hmm. guy got a case of the ass on me and he would not leave me be. <laughs> and he was upset. He got mad, I think, because Von Braun told me that if he ever showed up in any of my projects, you're in such trouble because he will take over everything. Well, we get pissed them to White Sands from uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. That's where we drove a, a, a semi down there that had Piggly Wiggly on the side of it. And uh, I always made fun of that. I said, is there an older store called Hoggly Woggly? Yeah. yeah. So anyway, <laughs> we, we had all these vehicles of different we look like commercial vehicles in traffic. Right. And we pulled up to the base and they uh, piston was wheeled into a C-141 star lifter. They don't make them anymore, but the huge aircraft, four big engines. Anyway, there was a ring of um, blue berets around it. And my rocket was wheeled right up into the belly of the plane and I, they opened the side door for me and I thought, man, all this is for me? God, I... I about had a heart attack, but about age yeah. 17 at this point, right? Oh, I was, yeah. I was just ripe old age of 17 at this wow. point. Wow. You know, people 
just don't get it. You know, I tell them this stuff and I said, what were you doing when you were 17? Trying to get a piece of ass or learn anatomy in the backseat of a car in the drive-in. <laughs> Not me. I'm carrying the weight of the world on me. I'm sitting there going, I can't let them have this rocket. Because they're going to turn it into a first strike weapon. They're going to burn a billion people in the Soviet Union and probably a billion in China the same day. So I can't have half the planet burned to ash because of what I'm building. Right, right. Now, try dealing with that when you're 17 years old. You know, most people think about getting a driver's license. What a big deal that is. No, I'm walking around being crushed by the weight of international events and if you make a mistake not millions billions are going to die so this has been a, it's, it's, it does things to you you just <laughs> you're not normal afterwards if I was normal to begin with <laughs> this just made it worse and um so that's what I had to deal with as a teenager yeah I didn't kiss a girl until I was 18 years old you know, I, I never had time. I was too busy doing all this stuff. Um, anyway, that's that's what people should learn about this. Because what can one person do? Well, you saw what Hitler could do. Well, you, there's other people. Yeah. You know, myself included, I've done some things that it altered the course of this history of this planet in a good way without you even knowing it. Otherwise, y'all would have died in a nuclear fire long ago. We'd be the remains of some nuclear holocaust aftermath. And it's like um, Einstein said when he saw Trinity go off, first nuclear weapon, he said, um, I don't know how man is going to fight World War III, but I know how he's going to fight World War IV with sticks and stones. We would have been blown back into the Stone Age. If I had to took my own creation out of the picture. Right. So that's what I had to deal with. Um, can we back up a skosh? And sure. uh, I wanted to ask about your mother having the dream with the name Pithilum. So how that like. Yeah. That, um, and I, I, I know, um, you know, you were like basically running around loose. You were a free range person at a very early age. And your parents really, like I said, put up a great support system for you. Yeah, they did. You had all the resources you need and they kind of like magically appeared by coincidence. They just, they just rolled with it. Yeah. I remember we were talking on the telephone line and Myrtle Crepes, <laughs> that's a real name. She came online and Myrtle, I was talking to LeMay about nuclear weapons and rockets and all that stuff. And she comes on and she goes, get off the damn phone line. It's a party line. Most people don't even remember that. Right. I was on a party line with LeMay. LeMay said, who the hell is this? And I'm Myrtle. Who the hell are you? And he goes, yeah, that's not important. You don't need to know. And Next day, here came an army of Air Force people with telephone poles, and they staked out a private line into our house. Right. And I thought, how odd. But that's the way things kept changing in our lives because things I'm doing. Um, so you had, a, you had a shop. Uh, you're, you were set up next to your parents' house, like in the same property. Right. Correct. With, uh, this shop where you worked on your rockets at this point. And, and because of um, your mother working in the hospital and that connection with LeMay, you, right. were given, um, you know, they brought you, they, they set up your shop for you and they, they, yeah, they came out and looked at the property and they said, what is that big facility over there? I said, yeah. oh, that's a, that's a defunct, um, I think it was Chrysler dealership. And they said, your parents own that, it's on their property. They said, yeah, perfect. So they, an army of Air Force personnel came in and re construction people redid everything. Yeah. And now I got this fantastic 
laboratory that's hidden behind a fake wall that rolls back and forth. So you can't even see it. Even if you walk into my front foyer, which was like a, a living room, what's behind the wall that moves back is this ungodly um, advanced, extremely advanced um, prototype shop. And uh, and I asked him to, um, I asked him, I said, can you get your Air Force people to wear blue jeans and plaid shirts and baseball caps, take off their uniforms? Cause I gotta live here. And they're gonna see, you know, neighbors gonna see these people. But if they look like that, I'll just tell them their relatives visiting from West Virginia or something, you know, and they don't care. He said, yeah, we could do that, good idea. And um, so everything was very quiet. People didn't understand, had no clue what the hell was going on with me, except my fellow students in high school, they knew something was up. Cause they said, that weirdness about you never went away. It's never <laughs> left. And they said, we find your weirdness kind of cool. We like you. Yeah. And we see you like a Billy Jack because you're always fighting with administration. Um, high school tried to, uh, teachers pulled uh, commitment papers. They were going to send me to Cambridge, Ohio for the mentally um, afflicted and put me there forever. And I thought, God almighty, if I ain't got enough problems now, I'm going to get committed. And um, fortunately, once again, all this force came out of nowhere. The attorney general shows up of Ohio shows up in our school and they're at the um just sitting in on the hearing of my um where they're getting ready to commit me and he had the county psychiatrist Dr. David Kramer work on me and um and what made the students start winning over to my side the teachers would call me saying the county psychiatrist there to look at you, check you out. They flip all the buttons where you could hear it all over the school grounds, out in the parking lot, playgrounds, everywhere. And I'm in the industrial arts shop and they said, David, you, the Dr. Kramer's here to see you. And the other people in the shop are looking at me going, why in the hell couldn't they just send a runner from the office down here and tell you? <laughs> That's embarrassing. What are they trying to do? Yeah. I said, it's all right, guys. Don't worry about it. They said, well, it's not right. And it's their parents doing it. Mm. It's getting real tight in this uh, world. So I go see this psychiatrist. He runs me through the test. You know, the ink blots, the square holes, round pegs, all that stuff. And um, he gave me a piece of paper one time. He slid over to me. It was blank. And I told him, it's upside down. He, <laughs> he reached out to turn it. And he stopped. And he looked at me. And he, he sat back in his chair and he smiled and said, okay. Smart. <laughs> smart. But uh, anyway, that's, I just like messing with him. But he gave his report to his boss, the attorney general. Now, this is going to determine whether I go into a mental institution for the rest of my life or not. Mm -hmm. This is some serious, no bullshit things going on. This is serious. Hell, this was in this time period, you never sued schools. No such thing. This is 1969. You don't sue schools. That's unheard of. So, um, they're having this big meeting, and finally the attorney general speaks up and he says, I want to tell you all this. I've listened to Dr. David Kramer. He gave me his report. He does not find the student in question to be any problem whatsoever to himself or anybody else. His problem is he's just so damn smart. And the psychiatrist told me there's something in his mind. Can't get to it. He's got a wall built. I can't get through it. I'd love to know what he's thinking, but I'll never learn it. And he said, um, so here's what I'm going to tell y'all. We should have schools built for people like him, but they don't exist yet. They will in the future, but not right now. 
So I'm going to tell you this. If I hear one more damn charge or problem from you faculty, somebody's going to prison. And it's not the student. It's not me. Somebody sitting at this table will go to prison for a long time. Because I don't want to hear this student being bothered anymore by anybody. And so things like that. Well, the kids were let out of school early that day, three o'clock. They, they left an hour early, two o'clock. So they had a big sit-in out in the front. You know, they're all a bunch of hippies, <laughs> what they are. And, um, but they just thought, you know, I was just fighting the establishment left and right. And they're looking, trying to get into the, theme of things of 1960. Was it typical for the um, state attorney general to visit a school if, if this... Um, That's highly unusual. That is what I'm saying. Again, you were, you know, saved from uh, uncertain yeah. fate. Yeah, he came in on his own after talking to David Kramer. David Kramer was the guy that made the difference. Yeah. he uh, He's the one I told him that the white paper was upside down. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I think he I think he liked me because he gave me a good report. He said there's not a malice bone in him. Yeah. As a matter of fact, he's all the stuff's being done to him, he's still nice. I don't know how he's even doing that. Yeah. Since to me, I've picked up a baseball bat and killed some people by now. <laughs> well, and you know, the thing is they didn't know all the other stuff you'd done in your life yet. You know, they only yeah. saw your academic work. They didn't realize what you've done oh, already. Man. Yeah, it was just, I'll tell you how bad it was. I won an award from, um, matter of fact, it's right there, uh, Award of Merit for Outstanding uh, Participation in the Junior Science Exhibit, 1971 Ohio State Fair by Dow Chemical Company. And the reason they gave me that award was I beat them <laughs> in competition. And there's Dow Chemical, and I came up with a better formula than they had. Right. So they gave me this award. Well, there was a second award. It was given to the school, saying in, this award is for Centerburg, Ohio's uh, Centerburg High School for its great support of its student. So the principal sees that award, and he goes, what is this thing? I said, it's an award y'all won. I won one for me, and this is the schools. So he takes it and slams it down on the corner of the counter and breaks it all to pieces, kicks it over in the corner. He never went to the trophy cabinet. And that's the way life was for me in academics. It wasn't easy. Yeah, people, uh, people don't, um, when they're jealous, because there's so much jealousy out there, because they don't realize that you worked for this. It wasn't handed to you. No. So when you hear the rest of the story. And um, so there's a lot of jealousy. And then, um, again, people don't understand, you know. And so they react in the worst possible ways. Yeah, well, the principal said, you know, I told him, he asked me where I was. I said, I was with the governor of, of Ohio. And, <laughs> he, and his reply was, I don't give you... A damn if you was Jesus Christ. You're not excused. You cannot go running all over the countryside doing stuff. And that's exactly what I was doing. <laughs> I, was, I was winning stuff left and right. And, yeah. uh, and that's that's another story. That's how I ended up being friends with um, Viola Armstrong. She has a son named Neil. And she was picked because she was the mother of the First man on the moon right. made her dignitary, and so she hung medals around the necks of the winners and stuff. And after about the sixth or seventh medal, she hung on my neck in the three weeks. She looked at me and she said, "What are you doing, child?" <laughs> I said, I "Guess I'm a little busy." She said, "Well, come on over to the house." And boy, we became best friends. It was one of the best things that ever happened to me. And um, she taught me how to can. You know, fruits, vegetables, chicken, you name it. God, we canned everything. We didn't can three or 400 jars. That was every single day. We 
canned about 30 or 40,000 jars. Whoa. Because we were not canning for a family. We were canning for Wapakoneta's co-op. They're Germans. Armstrong's German. And so the farms would come together in the co-op and we'd be canning for, a, you know, 50 families. So we had enormous... <laughs> We have, <laughs> didn't, always, <clears throat> didn't always go right. Something happened. I forgot what we put in. Something Viola put in the asparagus, and the damn thing started exploding. <laughs> so we had to go back up to the house and get away from the little shed area we had built. And we'd be sitting up at the house and here, bang, boom, bang. <laughs> and she said, we'll better stay up here for a day until this stuff calms down. I don't think glass could hurt you. And uh, I was standing next to Neil. He was visiting. And I ran right past Neil to get over to his mother then uh, to talk to her. And then she came up to me one day and she goes, David, um, Neil said something to me. I said, what do you think? He said, Mom, if I didn't get out of the way fast enough, I swear I think David would put a footprint on my head. And I thought, <laughs> oh, God. I said, did I hurt his feelings? She goes, well, if you get a chance, would you go talk to Neil? <laughs> now, how often does a human being get that in their life? You know. So look, you've already met all these famous people in your lives. And yeah. you've already had all these amazing coincidences or synchronicities, whatever you yeah. want to call them. Fabulous. It's just. um. And we're not done yet. No. Oh, my <laughs> God. It means it take another. It took a uh, poor, poor Art Bell. That poor thing, he interviewed me once, thought it was going to be just a 20-minute interview. Eight hours later, from 11 o'clock to 7 in the morning, he still asked me questions about this and that. And I, he got mad at the listeners because they were calling in saying, this guy's full of shit, man. Mm -hmm. And he's going, no human being could possibly come on to a show live for eight continuous hours. <laughs> it's not humanly possible. I'm, I'm listening to the guy, and what I hear from him is that he's not making the stuff up. He's recalling. It's recall, which means he's done this. It's history. He's just telling you what happened. And if you don't like it, it's just too damn bad. And uh, that's the first time Mark Bell on air got mad at everybody. But um, it was pretty cool. They sold more of those tapes. And he had the tapes combined. So, yeah, I am. Um, you can still probably order that pack. It was, um, oh God, it's, it's like a, it's like an eight pack of tape. <laughs> but, um, it's just such a long interview. But anyway, um, Coast to Coast had me on several times. And finally, I just quit going. I just got tired talking so much. Yeah. I'm, I'm coming out again, and I know I'm, I, like Michael Salas, I asked him, I said, uh, you're going to make an interview out of this, he goes, yeah, four-part episodes, and I said, uh, well, how'd your first episode go, did you get three or four people, he looked at me, he said, uh, you got to be kidding, right, he said, I got 9,000 people in eight hours, and he said, the others are going to be just as big or bigger, right, People are very interested in the story and yeah, some people I, don't know it yet, but uh, they're very interested. Yeah, it's um, Google told me it's got a life of its own. I said, I haven't done anything to promote this. I, I haven't talked about it or anything. And uh, Google said, no, it's like an itch America can't scratch. It's driving them crazy. He said, they're making up stuff about grandkids. The grandkids, I don't have <laughs> bring kids i don't have anybody you know yeah they said yeah well that's that's them trying to finish the story he said i guess you better get back out here and go at it i said i guess but um fabulous so, so let's um you know so you're about um say 17 let's talk about the pithalum rocket and remember the story where your mom had the, oh, yeah. about the name like tell us yeah, the well, story what happened i was working on the rocket it was sitting in the shop 
That thing was so pretty. You should have seen it. And I was doing the final details to it. And um, <laughs> my mother comes in, typical mother. And she goes, David, I had a dream last night. I want to tell you about it. I stop what I'm doing because if you know my mother, you better stop what you're doing because this is going to be interesting. So I lighten up a little bit on the work and I go, yeah, what'd you have there, buddy? What, what kind of dream did you have? She goes, well, I was out in the desert. I said, okay. There were thousands of people out there and they were in grandstands and there was this railroad track that ran between the grandstands. There's this huge rocket or spaceship being pushed by about three locomotives and they pulled it up and the top of the ship door got even with this platform scaffolding and you stepped out and it's you. I, I said, honey, you know, it's me. She goes, well, I, I know what my son looks like. You were older and what hair you had left was like uh, on the sides and it was white. And I said, and I had a full head of hair at that moment. It was a Superman wave. And I thought, wonderful. We're going to be bald. <laughs> I said, thanks, Mom. Uh, thanks, Mother, for yeah. letting me know I'm going to be bald. Then she said, you got up to the microphone. You thanked everybody for coming out here to watching this test of this fusion containment engine. And now she's got my attention. I said, really? What happened next? Well, you went back in. The the locomotives pushed it about a mile away, but then they came back to the grandstands. And then that that thing was sitting on a sled with rocket engines, and they lit up and started taking that ship across the floor of the desert. And then it went up the side of a mountain. And I went, oh, my God, perfect aim. Don't you have to? I said, what a, what a really smart way of saving energy and fuel for a launch. Yeah, and you went up the side of the mountain, and um, when you got to the ridge, you went, the ship kept going, the rocket sled fell off to the other side, and then your engines turned on that big rocket, and she goes, it was brighter than, you know, your father's welding light that we can't look at, it was brighter than that. Everybody had these special glasses, and that thing just streaked out of sight. She said, it was gone within seconds. And then there was a strange, really pretty, iridescent rainbow behind it. And I thought, now how the hell does she know about that? Because the heat of the engines of fusion containment is 50 million degrees centigrade, 10,000 times hotter than the sun. And when it streaks through our atmosphere, it's going to ionize everything. So she's describing this launch technically correct and I'm going how did my mother know about all this stuff she don't know this stuff and so I'm sitting there going well what happened well the trail just disappeared you know vaporized and you were gone and I'm going well, damn anything else yeah there's one other thing on the side of the rocket ship was this name painted here I spelled it out and I wrote it on a piece of paper p-i-t-h-o-l-e-m Pithalum. And I went, well, what kind of word of language is that? She goes, I don't know. Do you know I have, I've had linguists all over the country, all over the world, search for Pithalum, and there is no such word. It doesn't exist in any known language. They came up on one word that was very close to it. Uh, instead of P-I-T, I think it's P-Y-T-H-O-L-M. Python. And I thought, wait till you hear what this is. What's Python? I asked the linguist. And they said, would you believe that's the name of the god Apollo arrows in his scabber when he pulls it out to shoot it, which are considered the fastest things in the universe? I said, really? One letter? Yeah. God, that's crazy. So I told this story to uh, Mount Vernon News. And it's italicized in writing up there, but they talk about Pithlin and it's 1970. All right, whatever the date is up there. But yeah. Um, yeah. that's proof that I had that word. 
It didn't come from anybody else. It came from my mother's dream. Right. Now, later on, when I get to Area 51 and I encounter this alien power plant, it grabs hold of me and we have a talk and it talks and it tells me, hi, my name is Pithel. And I'm going, oh God. And I thought, how smart is this power plant? It's not an engine. It's a power plant. And it's its own entity. And it said, uh, I sent you the dreams, knowing that you're going to build this rocket, knowing that they, the Blackheart's going to drag you to uh, this base, Area 51, knowing that they're going to put you on top of me so you can walk down me, walk inside, and I can download in you, and we are leaving. And I went, she goes, how's it feel to be a lifeboat? I went, oh, God. So I've been played and played and played. Um, so so I think that's part of my point. All right. So, so look, I mean, there's a reason for all these synchronicities, coincidences, yeah. people coming to your aid, rescuing you, giving you equipment, shops, whatever it might be. Like, and again, I'm not saying it was all easy. You did the work, but it was like stepping stones for you to get to Area 51. So Pithalum yeah. we, entity not the rocket basically coordinated that and she gave you the dreams and she told you so that she gave yeah, you the dreams. yeah and okay. told me her name and yeah. and um <laughs> i remember the first few days i'm sitting with her and uh i can hear her inside she talks apparently other people can't hear it unless we want them to but she says um I'm asking her, how old are you? She goes, I'm 13 and a half billion with a B, billion years old. I went, really? Um, and then she tells me a bunch of other things. She, I even wrote them down. I remember. Ooh, yeah. She comes from a galaxy that's so far out there. It's the four... Their galaxy and three others are the four oldest galaxies in the universe. And the name that they gave her galaxy is Mesa's Galaxy. Mesa's? Yeah, M-A-I-S-I-E plus V-S. And that's the daughter of Stephen uh, Finkelstein. Stephen Finkelstein is somebody that I know. That's running the James Woods telescope. And they saw it. And so he named the galaxy that's so far out there and so old. They don't even refer to galaxies in distance anymore. They refer to them in time. In time. Okay. They said that May's his daughter name, and Pism told me that's not the name of the galaxy. She told me the name. And I went, holy smokes. And she said, they're 390 million years old after the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. So they were the first to be formed, um, making them the oldest galaxy. They're on a red shift, you know, because things are moving away from us, light spectrum. Um, but yeah, uh, if you type in Maze's galaxy, you'll see Pism's galaxy. Okay. 